fraudsters aren't encumbered by uh, a regulatory environment, uh, which allows them to be extremely nimble in in perpetrating fraud. Um, and so, what we uh, we do expect as an industry is um, is to see you know some persistent um, pressure on you know both the fraud and cybersecurity um, side. I I think the you know the best medicine to combat that is is also investing in um, in AI. We see a lot of uh, companies that are uh, making great strides um, on that front. Welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Timmy Nafso here. And with me is John Briggs, head of Key Bank Commercial Product and Innovation and Key Corp's Payments Business. He is responsible for the strategy, development, and the portfolio management of Key Bank's fintech partnerships, core treasury, commercial liquidity, merchant acquiring, integrated payments, and commercial loan product capabilities. John is also a CPA by training and historically spent time in accounting, finance, treasury, strategy, risk management, and has been in the payment space now for the past six years. John Briggs, welcome to the Embedded Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Timmy, for having me. Yeah, you know, impressive uh, uh, track record here. CPA. I'll tell you in college, it was my least favorite uh, course accounting. I, I had to take this final accounting class to get through. I struggled with depreciation uh, at times. <laughs> my balance, you know, when I'm sitting there and balancing out uh, these balance sheets and, and income statements, all that, I'm off by a penny and, and score was reduced quite well. Can I just give you the penny? Doesn't that, does it not work that way? Like it's just one penny, but um, <laughs> the retailer mindset is a lot different than the accounting mindset. Hardest test to take the, the CPA exam. Uh, tell me a little bit about that experience of, of becoming a CPA. That's, that's not, that's, you know, again, meta, you know, whether it was the DAT or the MCAT and we've heard all the different uh, 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 tests we got to take, but that's, that's a serious one. Yeah, and so my my journey to becoming a CPA um, unfortunately isn't all that deliberate or thoughtful. Um, it happens to be that in in college I had I knew I wanted to go in to business. I grew up in a family business, um, and so I knew without a doubt I wanted to be a business major. Um, I had an uncle uh, that actually uh, was a, di a dean and professor of, of finance. And so I'm sitting there trying to figure out what my major uh, was going to be. And I was like, well, if I can get through accounting finance, I, I think I'll be able to figure out, you know, the rest. And so that's literally how I decided uh, to become uh, an accountant and and pursue, pursue the CPA. Um, for, I met my wife actually uh, in in college, and and uh, frankly, I have a I owe a lot to her um, in terms of pushing pushing me along, you know, uh, down the, uh, down the path. She's also uh, a CPA. Neither of us practice uh, any longer, uh, so the the household conversation has gotten much more interesting. There you uh, go. You know, you know, from the early days. Yeah, and and uh, obviously the the books are all balanced at home on the whole home front budgets are all set yeah. i'm sure with you know two cpas in the house that's, that's that's great what what advice would you give you know today's college student if they're on the path to business would that be also like does that kind of groundwork set the stage or, or I, something a little you different? know i think so and obviously i'm biased you know because that's my background but you know accounting finance it is it's the language of, of business. And so I've always, you know, thought um, that if you come at any problem from a numbers first uh, perspective, you're ultimately going to be able to get a good understanding of, of whatever the problem is, the business is, you know, that you're trying to uh, uh, trying to engage in um, and you'll be able to grow uh, from there. So I think it's a it's a great foundation, whether you want to, um, you know, pursue actually being a public accountant or not. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned your wife and uh, a little bit about family life. I, again, amazing track record. It seems like you've been to a lot of different places as well. I love to ask the question of travel. Are you a big 
travel, uh, uh, you know, is that a bucket list type thing for you? Do you have some favorite places you've been or you love to go? Uh, lots of, uh, lots of places. So a little bit about me personally. Um, so I've got four, uh, four kids. Um, so ages, uh, four, six, nine and 11, um, nice. girl, boy, boy, girl. Uh, so our, our household is, it's, um, it's never, there's never a dull moment, unfortunately, although it's, it's about to get quieter with everybody going back to school, which will be great. Um, so like, I'd say broadly, any time that we're able to go do something with the kids and share that experience with them is is the best travel experience. And that can literally be, you know, if I'm taking a day off going to the Cleveland Zoo or jumping on an airplane and, and you know, crossing the country and, and exploring a new, you know, a new city uh, with them. Um, I always... Uh, I, so my wife and I, we, we debate this every time we have to think, uh, plan around family vacation, um, and spring break. We're very much, uh, confined at the moment to the, uh, you know, the continental United States. Um, yeah, exactly. she's not, um, quite interested in, in, in going anywhere overseas at the moment with, you know, still a four-year-old and, even though, you know, it, I romanticize about the idea yeah. of doing that, it's probably <laughs> not a good idea to be on a flight for an extended period of time uh, with the uh, the four uh, the four kids. So, um, but right now, I, every year, we, we go to this lovely place uh, up in New York called uh, Chautauqua. Uh, we spend uh, two weeks there. Um, it's been around, uh, this uh, place has been around for 150 years. They have the oldest state camp in the country. And the kids absolutely love it. Um, awesome. So they're happy. Gives Audrey and I, um, you know, a, a slight reprieve uh, during the day and allows us to do the things we enjoy. Um, so right now, I would say that is at the the top of the list. Uh, yeah, a little annual trip because of the same issue that, you know, you were talking about. My youngest is now 11. Um, so I have a 16, a 14, and 11-year-old, and it's went by very quickly. But our... Little Ohio, uh, uh, you mentioned the, the the Cleveland Zoo there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. How far away are you from that? Oh, what it's uh, twenty minutes away. 20, yeah. Well, we have a Sandusky annual trip that's been happening since they were okay. little, which is Cedar Point. Yep. Every year, Breakers Resort. I couldn't wait until it became a day trip. It was started off with a night trip, and I was like, okay, the Breakers is interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every year that we pass, it's that Lake Erie sand. It's really nice, though, but we've been doing it ever since. And the kids still ask every year, like, hey, are we doing Cedar Point this year? Are yeah. we going? So highly recommend that little fun trip. And they haven't discovered, what is it over there, the Great Wolf Lodge, I yeah, think, yeah. Yeah, with the indoor water park. <laughs> yeah. So I'm trying to keep my um, keep my kids away from that so they don't, yeah, awesome. uh, they don't discover it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them away from it. That's great. Awesome. So here we are talking about some key bank. So commercial product and innovation. If you could tell us a little bit about what that means uh, from from the key bank's perspective and your perspective on what some of the goals are from the seat itself. Yes. Yeah, so it's I would say maybe to um, to simplify it. If you think about it broadly, it's, it's our payments business um, here at, at Key, and so. What that means to us, it's everything from uh, what we call core treasury, others will call transactional banking. So think of core money movement like ACH, wire, RTP, uh, liquidity solutions. So think bank accounts, investment accounts, um, our acquiring uh, capabilities. Um, so this is everything from uh, enabling merchants to be able to accept card payments to enabling fintechs uh, to enable uh, their clients to accept uh, card uh, card payments, our issuing business, which uh, stretches from, you know, a, a prepaid solution, small business card, all the way up to large corporate TNE and um, capabilities. We have a robust set of fintech partners that help us uh, deliver on our strategy and um, it entails both, you know, partnering with those companies and commercializing their offering as well as investing in them. Um, and we like to do uh, to to do both, um, and then lastly, rounding that out is our international uh, capabilities. So if you think about trade finance capabilities and and foreign exchange, um, so it is it's been um, a top focus of of the bank um, for 
uh, several years um, now. Um, it's one as we enter this new um, regulatory paradigm um, as a bank, uh, everybody, uh, the gating items going forward are our deposits and um, and an asset light model or you know robust fee generating businesses and and that's what our payments business is. It's all about um, driving uh, fee based revenue and depository uh, relationships with our clients and growth. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And and what would you say over the last five years has changed? You know, this term of embedded finance is a new thing. I've heard you on some other podcasts as well talking about embedded and embedded finance. Um, we're certainly in that ecosystem of one of the arms of of embedded finance as a as a, a payment uh, company as well. Uh, and and how has it impacted businesses and banks over the last five years? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the way I think about it is, you know, we've, we've been living this as consumers um, and we've grown, you know, to expect out of whether it's our, our banks or other, uh, you know, consumer companies, just uh, phenomenal uh, digital experiences. Um, and, and what that means is a lot of the friction that normally comes with you know, transacting or banking is, you know, is, is, is hidden or masked by, you know, just phenomenal workflows, UI, UX, et cetera. Um, and that's been true uh, very much on the consumer side, started to bleed into uh, the small business uh, space. And you, you saw a massive growth in vertical SaaS platforms. And we continue to see that um, that growth. And now increasingly, it's starting to, you know, bleed into the up market. Um, and what it means for uh, banks uh, is we have to start to think differently about how we deliver our services. Um, so um, our, our goal as, as a bank, and, and I, I think increasingly most banks is, how do you get banking out of our proverbial four walls? and embedded natively where our clients are actually conducting their business. Um, so, uh, you know, a simple example, a accounts uh, receivable or uh, payable clerk, they don't want to sit in their ERP uh, as an example, do their work, and then log on to their digital banking portal, you know, with their bank, pull down reports, you know, pass information back and forth manually to be able to reconcile the expectation is that um, they don't necessarily have to go into the digital portal. It's all, you know, delivered to them natively where, you know, where they're conducting their business. Um, and it's um, it's been happening over the the past five, six years. And, and what we're seeing is an acceleration um, of that expectation. Yeah, the, the technology certainly has allowed us to expedite that process. And we're seeing Absolutely. that this feels like a constant race at times here uh people are running very fast um and and with that being said you are seeing that the the value that is being driven from that essentially is this one place one view being able to interact in this ecosystem that has less clicks less logins you know uh with that being said as it ties into the payments themselves what type of value is being placed specifically on the payment ecosystem from a from the bank's perspective? Yeah, it, so we talk about it um, strategically. Uh, we we call it just having primacy with our clients, and it's always been um, been part of our strategy. Uh, frankly, it's it's been a strong differentiator, you know, for us over the past uh, year and a half with all the uh, disruption that's uh, occurred in the banking market. And simply what it means is we want to, with each one of our clients, we want to have, you know, the core operating relationship, uh, which means we want to have, uh, you know, be the primary bank for, uh, for all of their deposits, all of their payments. Um, and that has been true, will always be true. What's changing is, you know, what's required to be able to have the right to that uh, to that business, um, and so for some of our clients, um, they don't they don't want to do a file based um, you know transmission. They want to have 
you know, um, an ERP plugin uh, capability. They want to consume, you know, bank APIs. Um, so it's forcing banks to, you know, modernize their infrastructure and, you know, and think, uh, think differently in terms of how we, we expose our services. Um, so it's um, the importance of the business hasn't changed uh, anymore, but I would say the, um, or I, actually I should say it, it's growing. Um, what's required to be in the game um, ha- is changing. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you mentioned some of the disruption that's happened over the last year and a half or even prior to that. Uh, Some of that has to do with banks that have folded and we've seen some scary things happen in the uh, banking environment. Um, And I want to kind of get your insight as to what and how that's occurred. Is it, you know, and there's a lot of different thought processes around security and deposits and Mm -hmm. leverage and things like that and and what your opinion is on that yeah um absolutely so there you know we um last you know march we call it march madness um uh, you know uh with what happened with sbb i mean that rippled through the banking system right and um it caused a lot of um clients um, to start to think about where, who is behind, um, my payments, uh, relationship. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of fintechs that are, uh, that, uh, play in the space. And I think up until SVB, a lot of clients didn't really think about who was the bank behind that fintech, um, or who were the fintechs behind the fintech. Um, and so I think one of the things that we've, uh, we've seen uh, changes just a, a focus on the what I call the supply chain, you know, of of payments. Uh, and for you know, for a bank, our you know, key bank, we've been around uh, for uh, next year will be our two hundredth year, um, and you know, we want to be around for another two hundred years. Um, our you know, our primary goal is to make sure. The, that we're not only serving our clients, but the system as a whole remains, you know, safe and sound. And so, um, the events over the past year and a half, whether it's SVB or or some other issues with banks and fintechs, I think the you know the lessons that uh, the ecosystem is learning is know, you know, understand your value chain, know who's involved um, from a bank perspective. Us understanding, you know, know your clients' clients. Um, and, uh, and the expectation is that we almost treat them as though they're our own from a risk management perspective and know where the money is, um, you know, and I think that, you know, there were some, some hard, hard learnings over last year as it relates to that. Yeah. And, you know, I think the consumers, you know, and, and the general population have this misunderstanding at times with their relationships with banks, right? Why are you asking me all of these questions when I want to wire some money? Why are you, you know, what's this KYC even in the payments world and we're, you know, approving an application for a business to accept payments in general, you have, you know, OFAC, you have the KYC regulation. So, you know, if you own more than this percentage of the business and all of these things have come from failed scenarios that because if we lived in a perfect world, we need to ask all these things. Everybody's honest. Everything's on the up and up. There's no failure that occurs, but we lived in, in a lot of failed, failed systems, but you know, without failure, there's no advancement is something that we've seen as well. So sometimes frustrating for, for the consumers, um, throwing a little bit of a, a little angle of uh, how we educate the consumer around these things so that there is an understanding that it is the regulation of the industry itself, that we're part of a bigger game. And these are the rules of the game has seemed to be a little bit of a challenge as we talk to the uh, the, the, the consumers, the small businesses, mid-sized businesses. Have you experienced some of that as well, John? It's a, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a constant, I don't want to say a, a constant struggle, but it's, it's something, you know, we always have to be in the business of yes. um, because you, you know, um, what's at tension with one another is you have, you know, you could have a phenomenal 
experience, um, but you may ex be exposing either the, you know, the client without them truly understand, understanding how they're exposed or the financial system to risk by enabling, you know, this very seamless straight through process. And at the other end, you can take all the risk out of, um, out of the system by, you know, putting a bunch of friction into, into the process. And so, um, the art here is finding that balance in the, in the middle, um, that is, um, you know, structured around, uh, the unique situation of, you know, that client base, that, uh, that ecosystem that you're, you're looking to, to serve. Um, so Absolutely. risk, risk is a spectrum. It's not, it's not a binary thing. Yeah. Yeah. You, and you mentioned that friction and frictionless experiences, which again, we're trying to shoot for towards this frictionless experience. So when, when a, a business <laughs> is searching for an embedded finance technology solution partner, what consideration should be there um, during that discovery? Yeah, I, th I think it is understanding, you know, I think the, the, the right to play is having the right technology to be able to actually integrate into the experience. Um, I think uh, after that, as you start to understand um, the, uh, the experience itself as as a client walks through that, whether it's a boarding journey or the settlement of a uh, transaction, understanding, um, you know, areas of uh, latency, turnaround time, and all of that behind the scenes is going to be a function of how much your partner has invested in technology to drive um, some of those uh, more frictionless experiences, um, more modern uh players that have you know invested in <clears throat> their ofac screening you know process uh, uh capability as an example are ultimately going to have a better experience with less latency than those who may have you know hamsters behind the scenes kind of turn in turn in the wheel and yeah. you'll you'll see it and you'll feel it as you start to understand it through your client's lens that you're trying to enable yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're also seeing this kind of hybrid situation occur where there was this era of no human beings at all. Like, hey, just don't talk to anybody. You don't need to talk to anybody. I mean, key bang being around for 200 years. I think that, you know, the people also matter through those experiences of kind of guiding these folks through what this might look like and feel like, you know, and I think they're, um, Certainly, in my opinion, what I've seen is that the winners still include a nice hybrid of balance of human and that frictionless technology experience that if, you know, the technology has got to work so great, but when you do need to pick up that phone, because there's a complex situation happening and the ERP with the bank with the right all these different ecosystems coming together that the people really do uh, play a large part in that. And how, how is your take on the people side of the business and banking as things move on when you know banking you know back to 20 years ago everything was about walking into that bank speaking to those people and now we've shifted we see chat support we see hey i'm somebody that doesn't want to talk to people right like that kind of experience shifted yeah. over over the years so i i think so uh service overall i think is a um for for both banks and fintechs is um it's an it's an area that I think is often underappreciated until yeah. something goes bump in the night. And if um, if you're you know deep in the in the payment space, you appreciate how complex moving money is, and you know the nuances that exist across each um, each rail and all the steps that have to go right for that to go you know seamlessly. And and nothing is perfect. Um, and it, uh, what we pride ourselves on is coupling, you know, industrial grade technology payment rails with a white glove service and acknowledging that there isn't, um, you know, uh, the, the system isn't, isn't perfect. And we've also invested in technology to help augment that white glove, uh, service. So, Absolutely. um, we partner with a, a company, uh, called Ovation, uh, CXM and to really help us control the client experience across, you know, what can be a complex value chain as you, you just think about card acceptance of you could be, you know, ERP, it could be the gateway, it could be the processor, it could be the bank. 
you know, and, and understanding, you know, what went bump in the night in that value chain and where to, you know, to route the client for a quick resolution is really important. And I think it's, it's both a technology uh, play as well as a people play. Yeah, that's awesome. That, that industrial grade technology that you talk about is continuing to shift and evolve. Heavy investments, I'm sure, are being placed in that um, ecosystem. So as you start to see that evolution occur over the next few years, we're hearing the, the words, you know, artificial intelligence. And what does that mean? Machine learning. But what are the specific industries you will believe that will be impacted the most from the bank's perspective over the next several years? Yeah, on the um, maybe from uh, uh, if we just talk about artificial intelligence uh, for for a second, I think um, on the threat side, uh, what you know, um, fraudsters aren't encumbered by uh, a regulatory environment, uh, which allows them to be extremely nimble in in perpetrating fraud um and so what we uh we do expect as an industry is um is to see you know some persistent um pressure on you know both the fraud and cybersecurity um side i i think the you know the best medicine to combat that is is also investing in um in ai we see a lot of uh companies that are uh, making great strides um, on that front, um, and we look forward to them being partners partners of key. I think outside on the positive side, um, you know, getting back to our the servicing point, AI has the p- uh, potential to be uh, a, a great uh, great technology to be able to augment our servicing team. So um, get those answers curated a lot faster uh, for them to be able to disposition you know, the needs of our client. And maybe one day um, we don't ha- <clears throat> have to engage, you know, uh, a, a human and the AI can handle it. I think we're, there's a lot that needs to be ironed out before we ever uh, get to that place. So I think the the quicker, uh, quicker win is going to be um, more augmenting um, or the co-pilot, you know, version of, of AI. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. We, we, we know that we've seen a lot of activity across the board as it relates with AI, even blockchain conversations, all these different things happening. Um, it's exciting to see key bank continue to be on the forefront of that type of innovation and continuing to grow. Um, John, anything, uh, you, uh, that I missed that you would care to share here on the, on the, uh, the key bank side of product and innovation? No, I, th- I think this, you know, for us, this continues to be a huge area of, of focus uh, for the bank. Um, we continue to invest heavily in this area because we do believe this is the future of banking. Uh, the future of banking is far more integrated and embedded. Uh, one of the latest examples of what we've uh, done in this space, we re- recently launched um, a solution called uh, Virtual Account Management or KeyVam. Um, and the way I, you know, describe it, it is, it is a modern, it's a modern operating account. There's been a ton of innovation that's happened on the receivable side of, of the coin, as well as the payable side. Um, it, the money in the middle is ripe for innovation. And, and that's what our key uh, solution is really focused on is, helping modernize banking and um, allow our, whether it's our uh, commercial industrial uh, client or uh, fintech clients, the tools to be able to more seamlessly uh, manage their business. Uh, and um, and I think that is, can, that you'll see that out of key continuing down that path, investing heavily in those areas. That is awesome. Looking forward to engaging with the product. And uh, I did want to thank you for joining the Embedded Podcast today, John. It's been a lot of fun learning about you as well as uh, uh, KeyBank and the products and services. Thanks for all the perspective. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Timmy, thanks. Uh, thanks for having, having me. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to seeing you soon here, John. Thank you.